Hello and welcome to the Magic Brain Kicks podcast, your podcast for a better understanding of the human brain and new innovative thoughts for the future. In any case, you will get ideas on how to kick yourself to move to a higher level. My name is Dr. Marie Hofacker. I'm an expert in modern brain research and sustainability. I support executives and entrepreneurs in creating future-oriented and sustainable human working and learning atmospheres. I am the host of this podcast and this and the next three episodes are very special. I was in Dubai and visited the Expo 2020 and learned a lot about future patterns, future ideas, modeling cities for the future. And I spoke to people who think about the future and shape it sustainably and humanely. My guest in this first episode from Dubai is Tom Borchett. Tom is director of ACCEPT Integrated Sustainability. ACCEPT stands for Sustainable Consulting, Design and Development. Tom will tell us in this interview some examples about this consulting company is building the foundations of a sustainable society. And Tom will tell us about his heart project, Orchid City. Orchid City is the world's first self-sustaining city blueprint. Orchid City reinvent how we coexist with nature and with each other. Orchid City goes beyond just being a beautiful place to live. It is a home for those who want to live happy, healthy lives in harmony with the environment and the community around them. Let's hear how this could work. As always, you can find more information and all links under the podcast in the show notes and, of course, on my website. Now, I wish you a lot of fun with this exciting podcast episode with Tom from Dubai and, above all, lots of new ideas. Yes, welcome to my podcast, Magic Brain Geeks. I'm or we are in Dubai today yes. and because uh, of the expo and because now we want to create new things, new ideas to spread the sustainability movement and of course concrete visions and concrete um, yes strategies, buildings or whatever. And I have with me uh, Tom Borschert. <laughs> he is Dutch and he is just uh, here for four days and uh, is he's uh, the director of Accept Integrated Sustainability and the creator of Orchid City, and it's a reinventing of future of the future of living, I would say. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful idea, and uh, he told me a lot. But therefore, I invited him to my podcast because it's wonderful to hear what you are doing and what you are creating for the future. Tom, please give us an idea. What is your background, and why do you do these things you do? Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. Still a very big question. Why do you do what you do? Um, I am Dutch. Um, I uh, originally born near Hilversum in the middle of the country yeah. in a forest. In a forest. It's okay. an important detail. Okay. Very big love for forests. Um, when I grew up, I um, went through a period where my family was in a lot of difficulties. Mm. Um, spent some time in a foster home. And from that perspective, not exactly growing up in the same kind of environment as other kids, I uh, spent a lot of time reading um, science magazines in the library. Um, Geo, for okay. example, oh, okay. as well as Kijk, which is a beautiful magazine. Um, and that gave me great hope to mostly think about not now but about the future and about scientific discoveries and nature when i was later going to university i thought i'm going to um, study things that will help to make uh, people's lives and universe and our planet a better place mm -hmm. 
I went to university to study industrial design engineering. And later on, I studied architecture and urban planning in the United States. Okay. Um, but during these studies in the very early years already, I noticed that they were not trying to teach us how to make the world a better place. Mm. And they were trying to make us design things that would sell as many products as possible. Yes. And that's something that greatly irritated me and it made me angry. Because why would I spend my time on doing that? Mm-hmm. So I decided to think about, well, let me find an organization that uses innovation and design as a way to make the world a better place. Uh, And I started researching, and this is the end of the 90s, Mm -hmm. and uh, I couldn't find any. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, you know, I found NGOs and organizations that... Uh, that have a particular purpose like War Child or Amnesty International uh, but not one that says no we're going to uh, readdress the foundations of how we live and what we do and mm-hmm. we're going to use innovation and design and uh, invention to do that and so I thought well I was always a little bit entrepreneurial I made my own little business when I was 13 years old and learned how all of that worked and so when I was 19 I thought well then if no one else is doing that then I might as well start and so I did Mm -hmm. and then I um, on that journey I moved to Australia where I uh, studied for a while and eventually ended up in the United States at Yale University Mm -hmm. where I also spent quite some time studying the science of sustainability called Mm -hmm. industrial ecology yeah and uh, have merged these elements into my practice that I do today. Um, for that, I developed a methodology because of the answer of what is sustainability. Very quickly in the first few years it became apparent that no one really has an answer for that. But if you don't know what you're doing, then you're not going to reach it either. Mm. So in the beginning of my uh, time I worked on some projects for example one for social housing where we replaced normal light bulbs with energy saving light bulbs the mm. CFLs as they're called and uh, we were quite successful in that I think it was nearly a hundred thousand light bulbs that we managed to replace in Rotterdam mm. and uh, a few years later I learned that those CFLs they do save energy but if you throw them away they release mercury gas yes and that is horrifyingly toxic Mm -hmm. for for all living things it's also bioaccumulative which makes it even worse so here you're trading energy saving for environmental damage and it made me feel terrible and that's when i learned look you can innovate you can come up with great ideas but you have to put research in its foundation You have to look in an integrated way at the world around us. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you happen to be interested in energy or biodiversity or social uh, development, that's fine. But you have to, for every project that you do, you have to look at all of them and look at what possible unintended side effects may happen on whatever systemic dynamics come out of it. So seeing society almost like a creature that has certain responses to things that change. Sometimes you're trying to do the best thing, but then the creature responds in a way that it moves back and it actually does more harm than what you originally intended to do. So that um, led me to learn about system dynamics and Mm. systems thinking, Mm. which is Mm. a beautiful, beautiful um, way of thinking about the world and how everything is connected that... uh, originates from actually from hundreds of years ago already and in the 60s and 70s had a great uh, great uh, development by many people one of the most famous people is Donella Meadows Mm -hmm. and she wrote this beautiful book about the introduction to systems thinking which also was a great influence to uh, the Club of Rome who for many people introduced the first yeah. report that led to global awareness on sustainability issues. So all of that becomes connected. Yes, in like, a own, in like a puzzle. Like a beautiful puzzle. Yes. 
And to me also as a person who's always been fascinated by things that are complicated and complex. <laughs> uh, you know. It's normally it's the other way around. Therefore, yeah, no, the more complicated it is, the more interesting. And yeah. every, especially things that are seemingly infinitely complex, like, you mm. know, an octopus that can change in almost like an LED screen and has such a complicated brain to be able to do that. They can, you know, master higher order thinking and how do they relate to the world and how can you relate to that? Those are fascinating topics for me. So, um, our big joint challenge on how to transition our global communities towards a sustainable state um, while at the same time living happy fulfilling lives uh, having uh, shared wealth and power as you might want to achieve uh, to restore biodiversity and ecological um, health um, All of those aspects coming together is, uh, of course, our greatest, most complex challenge that we have. Mm -hmm. So I'm fascinated by this. Uh, it is what I live and breathe. And my company is a, a vessel through which I can work with others uh, that I find inspiring. Both my colleagues, we're with about 20 people now, which is a good okay. size. Yes, okay. Um, mm -hmm. But also the clients and, and the partners that we work with that each have their own fascination and domain. Mm -hmm. So in the last 20 years, which is how long? 22 years, I believe, uh, we have been operating. It's been a fascinating journey. Mm -hmm. It's been a journey from discovering what the sustainability actually means to how can you make that operational? How can you earn money with it? Because I've never had subsidies or, or investors. It's always been self uh, self fueled financially. Mm -hmm. How do you build your team, mm -hmm. so the, the researchers and the designers and the business developers and the engineers? And how do you create a community around that of people that have this as a passion mm -hmm. where the job is, yeah, the structure in which it, the passion is placed, but it's really that cooperative. I like that. Mm -hmm. Also within nature, I'm inspired that research is clearly showing that nature is predominantly cooperative, yep. symbiotic. Uh Symbiotic, yes. I thought you, all, uh, for example, to pick one, uh, you worked with IKEA for to this to uh, the new printing catalog. I don't know. Perhaps you can uh, say something yeah. about that because I think often it's a little bit complicated to come from the outside in a company mm. who is uh, not perhaps so systematic and developed, and uh, you have an idea. And how do you <clears throat> how do you uh, pick it? Pick as um, Yes, this catalog is, of course, other for the customers. And so what kind of, how uh, was this project working? <laughs> yeah, it's a, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a story. Let's see if I can summarize it. IKEA came to us one day, and they had been working with some of the larger international consultancies Mm -hmm. uh, focused on reducing the negative impact of the IKEA catalog, mm -hmm. which was at that point in time, as we're talking about uh, 10 years ago, um, uh, their primary sales tool. Mm -hmm. uh, so they didn't want to stop making it. Uh, they wanted to reduce the negative impact. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, fair enough. But we, uh, they came to us, they put the catalog on the table and they said, please make this more sustainable. All the other bright minds from the consultancies have already tried. We have reduced uh, the, uh, the energy and replaced it with renewable energy. And we have made it out of FSC certified paper. And we are using soy ink. And we already have <laughs> the labor practices. Mm -hmm. But it's not enough because... The catalog is seen as a harmful device uh, by yeah. people. They get it often unrequested. It's considered uh, waste, and that's not what we want. Uh, that's not what we stand for. And so I thought it was a genuinely uh, a question with integrity, but they also said, you're not allowed to change anything about the catalog, not how many pages it has <laughs> or how big it is or how many we make of it or what's in it or its design. Just don't touch it. And it's kind of... It's hilarious because, well, what are you going to do? You yeah. know. So this is this a complicated challenge, yeah. and that's uh, exactly why we accepted it. So what we did is we we formed a team, and together with people from IKEA, mm -hmm. the clients, and some really smart people that work inside of the organization, we spent about a year 
and doing a, what we call a systems analysis. Okay. You're looking at everything, if you depart from that catalog, that touches it. Its supply chains, how it's produced, uh, why it is made, its marketing agencies. You learn a lot and you almost you create a swimming pool of information that you then learn to swim in at the same time. Wonderful yes. picture. Yes. And then at some point you start to enjoy it and you can start playing with it. And that's mm. more or less uh, what happened after that year, after that strategic uh, uh, analysis. We started noticing some things that we think that we could work with. Mm -hmm. First of all, it was the most produced book on the planet. Yes, it is. <laughs> there are dozens of different versions produced in hundreds of different f uh, facilities around the world, mm -hmm. participated by some of the largest paper, print and pulp producers that are all each year mm -hmm. participating in a race to get that year's commission for that particular variant of the IKEA catalog, which could be a significant financial impact for them. So in order to do that, and the previous uh, consultants already had that they would send in a lot of sustainability information and so on. So that these databases with lots of information each year, but they had no idea to navigate. Each year they would choose one particular thing. Okay, this year we're going to focus on water and then they would or, or evaluate on who has the lowest water. And the next year we do carbon footprint and the next year we do, I don't know, the social, social aspects. So each year it's very kind of like limited perspective because they didn't have a lot of time. They only had about a week to make all of those decisions oh, because the whole printing process. So it's, you start to learn about these processes and it, it, it's great. So the first thing we did was we developed a visual analysis tool that took all of those, I believe it was more than 500 data parameters and made a colorful mosaic out of it. Mm -hmm. Because your visual brain is far, far more capable of handling massive amounts of data yeah. than your analytical brain, which has to look at all the numbers. Mm -hmm. So you see one mosaic and you immediately can see by its color composition, which one will score better than the other immediately. Mm -hmm. You don't have to explain it. Your eye sees it and you know it. A child can choose. Wow. And mm -hmm. so that allowed them to make split second decisions. And in mm -hmm. total, bam, it increased 20, 30% stuff mm -hmm. that they had previously been just on a small percentage. But that wasn't really enough for us uh, because this was still reducing its negative input. Mm. And we have as a mission with the organization, it's like, okay, well, that's a good thing if you can achieve it, it's very nice, but we'd like to go further and we would like to see, can't we turn this around and make it into a positive impact mm. somehow? Mm. So what we then started to analyze is, well, if all of these organizations participate in that race, a couple of them get it each year, but all of them participate. We get all this data. We make the, yeah, IKEA makes this evaluation, makes a choice, and everyone goes, oh, I didn't get it. What if we make it into almost like a marathon that they're all racing to be evaluated on the best way possible on sustainability, and they know it. They know it because they... What we then developed was an automated sustainability report that came back to all of the suppliers where they could see their own score in relationship to all the others anonymized. Okay. And then each year the criteria were moved mm -hmm. and it created a huge impulse for the sales departments of all of these companies to go like, hey, John, in the sustainability department, I know you never got a budget to do stuff, but now you do because you want to get higher up in the ranking because we're in the yellow. We have to be in the green. We have to promise. That's how we did it. Mm -hmm. To have companies pledge millions to go from the, oh, you're almost in the red. So that's when you're uh, disqualified. No, we have to go into the green so we can get selected next year. Billions of euros were then monetized through these hundreds of companies that then significantly increased the sustainability of all of those companies that participated. That means that all of the paper products, the books, the newspapers, the magazines that all of those companies produced, not just the one that printed the catalog, all of them that participated, which completely dwarf what the catalog does. And we made estimates on the positive footprint of this and they were in even the first year a factor of a hundred or a thousand higher in positive contributions 
than the negative footprint of the catalog. So why that the catalog became a catalyst of change and that allowed it to have a positive footprint. And then we worked with IKEA to say, okay, we're going to build down the catalog over a period of 10 years time while uh, promoting this, this, mm. this method of change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe last year that was uh, effectuated. So the catalog is no longer there. Yeah. It's no longer produced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But during the last 10 years of its production, it helped to increase the sustainability of basically all the major print, paper and pulp suppliers around the world. Which is just, you know, fantastic. And that IKEA also went on this journey and, yeah, and yeah. enabled this process. And then using systems thinking that complexity to then find this almost like acupuncture. Because they didn't really have to do very much. Just send an automated sustainability report back, basically. It cost them a few million euros, but they saved hundreds of millions of euros in sustainability investment every year. So it was great. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm impressed about this puzzle and the visual, visualization you did. Wow. Yes. And uh, thank you for this wonderful <laughs> example. And uh, IKEA is, of course, a famous uh, uh, all over the world, I would say. Yes. And now let's uh, come to Orchid City. What is this? So Orchid City is my, is my big dream project. I think for, for as also an architect and an urbanist, I've been greatly fascinated by the built environment, which mm -hmm. I also think is not just a subject. It is a subject where almost all sustainability challenges come together. Mm -hmm. The energy, the water, the waste, food production, policy, social, uh, social connectivity, all of those aspects, they, they accumulate and materialize in, in the cities and the, the regions and how we live together. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a few years ago uh, after we've done a few hundred projects around the world that I thought, it is time for that big dream. I think the time is right now mm. where we put together many of the innovations and, and, and knowledge and experiences that we had gone through for the last decades, also together with partners. So it's mm. a, in a partnership where we said, you know what? We have all of the answers for all of those parts on how we can create a, a living environment that is actually sustainable like entirely so not just energy production or just you know water and so on but all of the daily weekly monthly services provided for by that environment so that means all of the food all of uh, the things like uh, essential uh, products so clothing um, waste management uh, schools social services healthcare okay. uh, production jobs mm -hmm. you know uh, office jobs uh, education entertainment all of these aspects that form a part of a daily life mm -hmm. they can be integrated and they don't require any particular technologies to actually do that But by integrating them, they start um, symbiotically supporting each other. Mm -hmm. For example, water purification, water filtration. Currently, we put it in the sewer and then it goes to the end of the municipality where there is some kind of industrial thing with some basins, beautiful technology, and all they, they clean the water and then they throw it back into nature or sometimes it gets reused. But if you use uh, natural elements for this, like phytoremediation and constructed wetlands, they become part of your living environment. And then you have these water areas that you can use for stormwater collection mm -hmm. that increase biodiversity, that increase the value of your house because water increases the value of your house. It can be used as a distribution method for water for agriculture. Uh, you can... Uh, go on a little rowboat on it and enjoy your time. So it does all of these different things when you kind of like turn it back into kind of a, an ecosystem service oriented system. And then it's actually cheaper because you don't have to build that sewer system okay. or that purification plant on the edge of the city. So um, all of these things start to make sense when you integrate them. Um, often 
when you just do a limited a little bit of sustainability here and there you you smack some solar panels on it and you have some fancy control technology yeah it'll cost you money and it'll have a 20 year payback to your period or a 10 year if you're lucky but if you really start integrating it you start seeing that they start adding up and that's how we started developing um uh a mathematical model, a calculating model of okay. a whole living environment that keeps it I- itself in balance. So that has all of these essential services, that has all of this what we call a metabolism of energy, material flows, of food production, of waste management, that um, then supports also the cohabitation between elderly communities, younger communities, uh, that uh, helps to uh, help people to develop in their personal development trajectory, young or old, lifelong learning. Um, so all of these things become possible, and because they don't rely on any particular trick, uh, they're not that particularly more expensive than if you do it in another way, but because of the configuration is different, you can actually manifest this. So it's affordable. Mm-hmm. Um, we're currently aiming for about 30% social housing as part of the uh, community. It's completely integrated, so the more expensive and the cheaper houses are all together. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've built a, a model that can scale from about 500 uh, different people? housing okay. or people uh, to to 50,000. Okay. And that's so large. Yeah, it's very yeah, large. Yes, it's, uh, and then you get different nuclei with kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, shared transportation between them. It's all from bicycle distance still in that size. Okay. And different densities. So you have urban densities in the core with uh, different levels of uh, services in there. And then you have a bit more rural areas on the outside where it's more country-like living. Mm-hmm. Because everything, well, not everything, because there's about 30% uh, re- regenerative nature as mm-hmm. part of the story and then uh, you have the agriculture that's productive so you have double productive land so you have the living and uh, working and producing and agricultural integrated in these uh, communities then that becomes a model for a climate adaptive renewable bio-based environment that's actually for we can build it today you don't mm-hmm. need to invent anything um, it's imminently investable because uh, it, it will retain its value much longer than a normal housing community that you would build. Um, and it resolves all kinds of other issues like, for example, uh, rural uh, people drain. You have these rural communities where people just leave because there's no jobs, there's no services. But this integrates them so it can revive those almost forgotten communities in the countryside and also limit that that uh, urbanization of the large cores which makes uh, uh, all the difference in southeast asia for example where we're currently looking at in vietnam mm-hmm. uh, also the climate adaptive properties of flood protection which really is important there um, and also uh, the uh, new um, a regeneration of the agricultural practices to really be sustainable, uh, ecologically powered, organic agriculture, which then becomes also feasible with like a, a manageable business model and so on. So all of these things come together. And as you hear, it's complex and I love that complexity. But in reality, it's really rather simple. It's a wonderful place to live. Mm-hmm. And it's not just live, uh, not just houses. It's also education and working and all of that integrated. And um, we are currently exploring for locations, mm-hmm. so finding municipalities, finding property owners, property developers that are interested in uh, taking the next steps on creating the master plans for these locations. Mm-hmm. And then we hope within a couple of years to actually start building them. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you can build it, uh, uh, yes, in a short period as you have uh, these models, because I saw um, 
in, in the expo, they are, of course, they are discussing the new sustainabilities, new sustain uh, cities, and um, they are, have ideas to build new capitals, very carbon free and not uh, like you, uh, very systematic, but just to highlight the, the uh, yes, the buzzwords, I would say. Yes. Uh, in the beginning, mm -hmm. you s s said you have to define what is uh, sustainability. You have to define um, the systemic um, aspects of sustainability. And normal it is, okay, we have to be carbon free and we have to be uh, perhaps... Yeah, yeah, it's uh, like pick and choose. Pick, yeah. yes, something yeah. like that. Yes, exactly. And uh, what uh, will be the next steps? What do you think is the next steps in the next 10 years do, um, as you, you are looking worldwide, I think, for uh, some possibilities to create this, uh, yes, one of these orchid cities? Or yeah. do you parallel? Or what? Yeah, we do several in parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, we've uh, estimated currently, uh, also with the investment that we've, uh, that we're currently uh, receiving, that we can do about two or three at the mm -hmm. same time. And then once those are kind of up and running in the next couple of years, we can then it's trajectory, then we can put some more in at the beginning. But we don't want to go and immediately do 10 because then our attention will be divided. Um, and we really do feel it has a bit of a, yeah, we call it like a lighthouse quality to it. Mm -hmm. Like once we are uh, further along and once one of the fir first communities starts operating and we can prove uh, that this is a reality, we expect it to be copied. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want. Okay. Just as, as I mentioned, the methodology that I developed, that symbiosis in development, that yeah. systems analysis, uh, innovation method. So I wrote a book. It took me 10 years to do it. It's right here in front of me. It's very fat. And, uh, yes, and I think, really. Uh, yes. It's a complete, Massive. basically, yes. omnibus for everything. But it's completely open source. So mm -hmm. you can download it for free from the website. Yes, okay. Um, I put the website in the show notes, of yes. course. Yes. yes. With the whole idea that it be stolen. I want people to steal it. Yes. I want people to steal the ideas and maybe even, I don't even care if the, if the name is on it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to uh, go into the future and make money by selling the methodology. Mm -hmm. As long as other people are, it's useful for them, then please do that. Mm -hmm. um, so the same with Orchid City, we will be developing intellectual property and developing special software tools to help us with this. And then we'll be investing in these uh, uh, neighborhoods that will then be sold and rented out and so on. And so uh, profit is part of that story, mm -hmm. but that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is well, what we were just talking about. And the word resilience is very important in that. Mm -hmm. It's not just that the neighborhoods are... Uh, capable of dealing with the changes that we'll be facing in the next decades, because mm. we will yes. think change will become the new norm mm. uh, faster and faster. And we, and then our children and going on, will will have to deal with increasing rates of change. Mm. And that's where resilience becomes increasingly important to be able to elegantly deal with that change. And that's also a worthwhile investment. So what are you going to do as terms of investment with your money, mm -hmm. but also with your time? Where do you spend your time on? On something that's just relevant for a couple of years and then it's outdated and or it's broken? Or on something that can continue to evolve and mm -hmm. continue to become an element of the foundation of the solution that we're after? And I'm looking for that. Mm -hmm. Because as things are increasingly rapidly changing, I'm sure you know that curve, right? The yes. hopstick curve, CO2 and of species disappearing, and it's all that curve. Mm. For us to be able to at least try to keep up with that rapid change, we also have to use exponential evolutionary trajectories to exactly. change. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, locking things into boxy, mm -hmm. technologically oriented things that are a one-off. It's like, okay, this is, this is only going to build a new neighborhood. And it just complies to today's standard of uh, mm -hmm. what we can sell on the marketplace as being sustainable. Mm -hmm. What we see in the expo here everywhere. Okay, we've chosen sustainability to be energy neutral by 
putting a lot of solar panels somewhere far away and then that's our definition of sustainability then well i'm going to give it five or six years before people are just like no that's not it and then in in 15 years time you know all the other aspects of the biodiversity aspects the waste aspect the social connectivity the education the um um the material scarcity issues mm -hmm. they they will catch up with it yeah. and they will make sure well they will make sure they will they will cause it to run into trouble again mm -hmm. so i think that today you can do that sort of thing you have to think a little bit more mm -hmm. before you yes. make that statement <laughs> it's sustainable yeah. and things like that yeah. but it'll, it it pays off uh, yeah. in every project that we do we can see it yeah, so there's a bit more time and, and thinking involved in the beginning, but then it really all tends to come together. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that's hugely inspiring for me. And that's the yes. energy that I get to to keep doing this. Yes. Yeah. And you create hope, of course, uh, yeah. that, that we can change or can, yes, uh, deal with this problem, this huge problem we have. Now. Yes. Yes. Sounds great. Yeah. Yes. And what is your personal vision uh, or your, uh, yes, what do, or your mission, whatever you can create in the next 10 years? When you came to 2030, what uh, do you think? Is it, uh, is, uh, we have uh, already some orchid cities or what is your vision? What will be in 2030? Um, I think that in 2030 we'll have uh, a few orchid cities that have been running for a while mm -hmm. that also have learned and have become into their second evolutionary phase where this, what we've been talking about is the foundation, but in terms of our social software, I'm just kind of naming it the, um, the evolution of how we can connect better as people together. Mm -hmm. For example, we currently have this idea, but it's also something that could evolve that we are trying to uh, create a business model where students uh, can, uh, can get uh, uh, additional financial support if they help to take care of the elderly community in their neighborhood. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And so this is a model where everyone wins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there is increased social connectivity and engagement. There is a knowledge transfer for all, from old to young, but also from young to old. Let me help you with your iPad, Grandpa. Yeah. You know, but also like uh, listen, son. This is how the world works, <laughs> um, right? So, so that sort of uh, social evolution and the models that go with it. Uh, I think that that's uh, where in about nine years' time will be in the second evolutionary cycle of uh, increasingly. Uh, connect better in our living environments. Mm. I think around that time, maybe we'll be working on a franchise model mm -hmm. where the knowledge and the experience that we have can be compartmentalized into knowledge entities supported by software and organizational uh, support that allow them to be uh, locally implemented while being adjusted to local context and culture and, uh, and the environment. Um, and, um, yeah, I think that's quite realistic. I don't yeah. think it helps anyone to really kind of like uh, kid ourselves that we're going to have created a fully sustainable planet in nine years' time. You'd, you'd wish to, but uh, maybe maybe in 40 or 50 years, well, we're going to have to, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sounds great. Yeah. And some, uh, someone who is hearing this now, uh, can he or, he or she be part of it? What uh, can uh, can someone do? I know that depends on who you are. Mm, of course. <laughs> um, we, we, we are actually really helped with just simply spreading the news. Mm -hmm. So orchidcity.eco is the website mm -hmm. uh, for Orchid City and for Accept, the company that we're, is accept.eco, mm -hmm. um, to spread the news that these kinds of things are possible yeah. and to exchange that it opens doors for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's say, for example, I go to Vietnam in a couple of days after mm -hmm. this to talk with the central government and local municipalities. Now, if this is, is this is well known, mm -hmm. it's easier to get into the door and to get invited. It's easier to get investment. It just smooths everything out. Mm -hmm. So awareness in that sense is something that really helps. Then, uh, depending on what 
role people choose to play in society for themselves. Mm. Um, yeah, we you know we'll need great people to help us, great organizations, partnerships. Mm. Uh, organizations that build bio-based housing, organizations that provide new ideas for education, for uh, that sort of thing. We, we're currently not that big yet, so it's 20 people, so we're not able to handle thousands of inquiries at the same time, so we're a little bit careful about that. Uh, but uh, yeah, great ideas, we'll be able to filter them and see if we can support each other. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is going to be a community effort. From the world's community. Yes. Uh, and interestingly enough, so this is really something that appeals to those who basically already 10 years ago knew that we need fundamental change. Mm. And this is something that I believe and that I've seen also with my peers and partners. It provides a new, a real new hope because it's, it's, it's real. Yes, we can really do this, yeah. and we can do it in the desert of uh, of, of the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, we created a system that allows us to uh, grow fresh food using only salt water and sunlight. Wow. So now the project called Serenity Farms, uh-huh. uh, but that can be integrated. So mm-hmm. depending on the circumstances, mm-hmm. uh, you can adapt it to the local conditions, and you can do it in. In the desert, you can do it in the mountains, you can make it big or you can make it small, and you can work with the local community to do it. Mm-hmm. It's not as if we come in and design all the houses and do everything and then leave. Mm-hmm. No, we go in and we find local architects and we, we transfer the knowledge and we allow them to adapt it and then they design the houses. Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, yes. that's how we believe that we can do it. Yeah. Yes. And it's really hope. It's, yes. Yes, it is. It really is. Uh, yes, and it's a community pro- uh, project, as you said, and a global uh, community project. Uh, everybody is invited to to take part or to be part of. Absolutely. It. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tom. It was great to hear all about this Orchid City and to this vision, and of course to be part of that we can change something in the future and to be for our children and for the whole, of course, world. Thank you so much and big success and, of course, yeah. uh, yes, we are looking forward to hear more. <laughs> oh, thank you. It was a real honor and, and enjoy Dubai and the, the expo. And I'm yes, uh, really, curious to yeah. find out what you think. <laughs> There is a whole sustainability pavilion that mm. I think does show that uh, we've got a way to go in mm. education and awareness. Um, still retelling the same old story yeah. uh, that isn't appealing to people no. because it doesn't have a vision. Yes. It only addresses a problem. Yes. And, and that's what Orchid City does differently. Yeah. 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 And it's not like, you know, hovering drones everywhere and everyone flies a car to work kind of stuff. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, yeah, it's a nice idea, yeah, I guess. This is but a little bit Hollywood idea. Yeah, but also if you really think about it, you don't want that at all. Yes. Exactly. You know, like, do you, this is the same thing as, uh, let's change the world, let's replace all cars with electric cars, and then we've solved a lot of issues. Yeah. But then you're standing in traffic for an hour and a half in an electric car every day. Is yeah. that how you would want to change the world? Yes. No, it's not. Yes. So how do you fundamentally address the problem rather than, putting a band-aid on it and then waiting another 10 years until the problem comes back. Mm, exactly. Uh, and yes. I think you'll find there's <laughs> enough uh, to think about when you visit Expo uh, and what each country has to say about this. It's quite fascinating. Yes. Yes, yes I'm very glad. I will do that tomorrow. Yes. Thank you okay. so much, my Tom. My uh, Yes, you spoke from my heart. It's so wonderful to hear that and that uh, all this is possible and you are Yeah, currently creating it because you find uh, people around the world who su- will support this. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Okay, goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to my podcast, Magic Brain Kicks. I would like to invite you to share this podcast, to give a comment and a like on iTunes. And if you want more information, please visit my website under drmariahovaga.com. Hope I will hear you soon and kick your brain and goodbye.